Hey there, everyone. You are listening to the Guitar Speak podcast, produced here in Sydney, Australia. My name is Matt Wakeling, and thank you so much for joining me today. Now, today is our NAM special, a week or two out from the Winter NAM convention in Anaheim, California. We spoke to our good friend Michael Ross, who attended that this year. He's been to lots of NAMs, and uh, it was great to hear his insights. Now, of course, Michael, we interviewed back in episode six of the Guitar Speak podcast. Great musician, great guitarist, really well regarded and respected journalist who currently writes for Guitar Player magazine and Premier Guitar, and very soon uh, putting up a regular column for Electronic Musician. Now, Michael, of course, he also curates the wonderful website Guitar Modern, which is really dedicated to unearthing and discussing the world of explorative and avant-garde guitar playing approaches, gear, players. When Michael goes to NAMM, he really brings that kind of mindset as well. So I really enjoyed our conversation. Um, Michael's looking out for stuff beyond, say, the latest hot-rodded Tube Screamer clone or, or stuff like that, although we certainly spoke about a lot of gear that would find their hands in many different guitar players for many different styles. All right, so here we go. Here's our NAMM special with Michael Ross. Check it out. So, Michael Ross, welcome back to the Guitar Speak podcast. It's good to be back. Good to talk to you again. Michael, thanks for coming back on. Um, we've got you back on because you're at Winter NAMM this year, which happens in January in Anaheim. How, how was NAMM for you this year? NAMM was crazy. It was, it was completely insane. Um, I haven't seen crowds like that. I've been doing this for a long time, and it, I, if I've seen crowds like this, it goes well back before the uh, you know the crash of 2008 and who knows when because it was it was nuts from day one. Wow! And in a good way. I mean, it was I, except for the crowds and the incredible din of the noise floor level. Um, it was you know the interest I think is because there's so much new really cool stuff happening. Okay. I maybe should backtrack a little bit. NAM, like, essentially was and is a trade convention, but it does seem to have blown out to this massive event each year now. Well, it's, yeah, it's National Association of Music Merchandisers, which yeah. um, theoretically the show is where makers of musical products um, can display their wares to music store owners and the press mm -hmm. uh, but from the looks of this year it's a lot easier to cage a badge than it used to be mm -hmm. because if all these people are music store owners and press there's a lot more music <laughs> store in the world than there used to be um there's also there's a lot of a lot of artists come uh yep. who are endorsers or artists get badges from their local music store so that they can come down and try and get endorsements and there's certain perennials. You know Stevie Wonder is going to show up every year, usually with an entourage. Okay. Walking yeah. through, checking out the stuff. This year I was having lunch, I think on Saturday, with a friend at the Marriott Hotel. And uh, there was a kid, young, blonde, long-haired kid on stage playing Superstition with an acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. And Stevie got up and sang with him because he forgot the second verse. So Stevie wow. got up on stage. <laughs> and sang with him and it was it was amazing and and the kid had a great voice i mean uh -huh. he, he held his own but it was it's those kind of things that you know make nam at least winter certainly winter nam kind of special and um are you familiar with snarky puppy yes yeah yeah is it mark so, Terry? i think is the guitar player yeah my, my, mark Terry is one of the three guitar players okay. i think he's become sort of the main guy okay and yeah. michael uh i forgot michael's last name the bass player but they just played a duo in the dunlop booth just the two of them mm -hmm. that was funk extravaganza it, wow. was, it was mind boggling with no drums what these guys can do so that's fun stuff too and there's usually there's demos in all the booths but as I said, the noise was so crazy this year. It was really hard to hear anything. It's become harder and harder to hear anything, unless a, unless a manufacturer has a closed-in soundproof booth that you can go into and actually play their stuff. It's kind of uh, pointless. I go and I go and try and figure out what looks interesting, and then if I'm really interested, I try and get them to send it to me so I can try it out at home. Okay, yeah. Uh, you can actually hear it, but. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, that's pretty much what NAM is. And, yeah, cool. Uh, the summer show here in, is in Nashville, where I live. Yeah. It's way smaller, much more guitar oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, the winter shows become more and more guitar oriented and pedals for days and days <laughs> and days. And, um, but it also has the drum ghetto where people are bashing on drums and <laughs> the horn area where people are playing trumpets and saxophones. And um, it's, it's a musical zoo. It's wow. pretty interesting. So I understand the the venue's broken up into different halls. Like I think it's A to E. So there's five sort of main halls. Yeah. Uh, on the main the main floor is A through D, I believe. Okay. Yeah. And then E is downstairs, which is um, and they've started letting people in early to the hall downstairs, nine thirty instead of ten o'clock because I guess those people feel they're getting a little short shrift being down there, so they're given a half hour jump. Yeah. But Hall E has always been the hall of, um, well, I used to say bad ideas, but now it's just become new ideas. Okay. That's where you see all the weird <laughs> stuff, all the all the new ideas, some of which are terrible and some of which are have become really interesting. That's where, and that's where a lot of the boutique pedal guys start out before they get big enough to move up to the main floor. Okay, yeah. So there's... Um, no, I love Holy. I mean, that's where I spend a lot of time down there because that's my peeps down there. <laughs> they're, that's cool. They're, they're, doing, they're doing some great stuff. There was some great stuff down there this year. I mean, you don't, you never know which of this stuff is going to ever actually show up in production or distribution in the United States. But, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of Chinese manufacturers down there that basically either make... Um, you know, knockoffs of American guitars and stuff like that. Okay, but there's yeah. a, there was also there was one Chinese manufacturer down there this time that had this really cool iPhone holder. Because a lot of guys, you know, doing especially doing singer songwriter gigs or you know restaurant gigs, they're reading charts or words off their iPhone. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And this they, they these guys attached a high an iPhone holder to a capo. So if you're okay. playing guitar, cool, you can have your iPhone you know clipped to your hood stock, and then if if you need a capo, you just move it up the headstock, but you can keep reading your iPhone. Okay, that's cool. And they had an, uh, some iPad holder that slipped under the guitar that looked really interesting. Um, so, you know, there's stuff like that shows up down there. And then, you know, every now and then there'll be some guy with some weird pick that nobody ever really wants to use. And, <laughs> um, but somehow he decided to spend a lot of money on manufacturing them and putting up booth on the... Uh, in uh at nam and and hopefully learns his lesson in one show um but like as i said there's lots of lots of really cool manufacturers down here the thing this year i mean when it comes to pedals it seems the greeks and the brazilians are starting to make heavy moves into the market okay yeah um, jam pedals has been around for a couple of years and guys like ivan arset are using their pedals a lot of Fairly big names are using their pedals, and he's Giannis is a great guitar player, uh, sort of modern guitar player. I did an interview with him for GuitarModern.com, um, my website. Yep, we will definitely and, uh, talk about that too. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and he did some interesting stuff with Ivan over in Greece, and but he makes these great pedals. And this year he just had amazing looking housings. That's a big thing with boutique pedals is. You know, a lot of people are just making the same old fuzzes, overdrives, and sure, yeah, delays and stuff. But they're putting them in these, um, you know, bespoke pedal housings that mm-hmm. are works of art. They're beautiful. A lot of them are just beautiful. And uh, Giannis makes some cool pedals, but he also this year was showing some uh, very interesting, interesting uh, pedal enclosures, which I'll have pictures up of up on the site right, um, right. within the next couple of weeks. And uh, and the who's there's another pedal. What's the, I, I don't even know how to pronounce these guys. Uh, something Sadikus or something like that it was a Greek company that had some interesting stuff. And then I don't know if you or any of your listeners uh, watched that pedal show. Oh, I love that show. Yeah, with with Dan. We've had Dan on on this podcast actually. Yeah. Oh right, he's a fellow uh, Australian. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so they have been, as anybody who watches it knows, they rave about this pedal of Carpe Diem all the time. Yeah, yeah. And I finally got to try one of those. He's Brazilian also. And uh, and his English is not, you know, very good. Of course, it's better than my Brazilian. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but we were talking and he's trying, you know, people come there. That's the other thing is manufacturers come there looking for distribution. They're looking for yes, yeah. distributors to pick up their stuff and, and sell it for them in the United States so they don't have to sell it on a piecemeal basis. But I, I, I mean, that thing sounded amazing. It's one of the pedals I actually got to hear. And okay. I understand now I understand why those guys rave about it. It's just it's a terrific sounding overdrive pedal, just really smooth and stuff. So he was one of the Brazilians. And then there was a couple of Brazilians that live in L.A. now called and they're companies called B something. I'm going to, let me move my notes over here. Mm -hmm. my, uh, oops. Um, you didn't lose me. Did you? I'm just, no, no, gotcha. Well, um, while you're looking, just... did you, did you see the Keely pedal that was, um, that's for the pedal oh, show guys? Dan. Yeah. yeah Dan and Nick. Um, actually, you know, I, saw, I, I saw it on their, you know, their podcast. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. I, I didn't get a chance. To, Keely's one of the companies. I mean, you know, there were just so many. I just didn't get a chance to check out everybody, and I was trying to concentrate on the people that were doing. You know, because of my position now, I do write. I write for a guitar player. I write for premier guitar, yeah, yeah. and for them, you know, I will review. I don't do gear reviews for premier, and for a guitar player, I'll do gear reviews of stuff maybe that's not as, you know. Um, that's not as relevant to my site, you know, which, which deals in more weird sounds and sure. stuff. So, I mean, Keeley makes great stuff. I was just, before we talked, I was just playing through his blues driver here. Okay. Going yep. crazy. Um, but it's not the kind of stuff that normally is going to be of interest. So I, you know, I just didn't get, a, get around to it. I did see Mick at the show. Oh yeah. Cool. But I didn't. I didn't see Dan. Um, but it was great to see him. I've known him for uh, you know, a couple of decades now because uh, of I, I don't know. I guess we met on some junket maybe when he was at Guitarist and I was at some magazine back in the days when manufacturers were actually flying people over. To okay. Yep. So we met a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I, I didn't get to Keeley for that. But um, what was the other? I was looking up this Brazilian. Yeah, yeah. Oh, B B Tronics. Yeah. Okay. There are some. They live in L.A. and I'll put pictures of their stuff in. I didn't even attempt to hear the stuff because it was it was all meat and potato stuff anyway. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know the odds on hearing at this point an overdrive or a fuzz that is or a, you know a delay or a compressor or a chorus that's gonna that's going to revolutionize the world is, you know, fairly slim. So sure. unless there's something in there that, you know, they say, Oh yeah, this pedal makes weird glitching sounds and, you know, it's delay mixed with fuzz and an octave, then, you know, then it might be, it's more interesting. Sure. But, um, yeah, I mean, I went, I did cover a lot of people. Um, crazy tube circuits is another Greek company and I've reviewed okay. their stuff in the past. Um, and they they made some nice they make some nice stuff. I finally got a chance to try out a Death by Audio pedal. Oh yeah, and cool. I'm familiar with that. That they're out of Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and I call them the cliche killers because their stuff is so far from any kind of normal pedal that you've ever <laughs> played through that it's just pointless making you know playing a blues run or a rock riff <laughs> That's or great. it doesn't make any sense you've got to create something new with them which i i really appreciate about them and i played uh i played through some really strange pedal of theirs um but other interesting stuff i mean um digitech uh as i i reported in my um nam report last year mm -hmm. Since this guy, Tom Cram, has started working for Digitech, I mean, we all know Digitech as being sort of meat and potatoes, inexpensive yeah. pedals, mm -hmm. Digitech and DOD. Sure. But sure. Tom has turned that company around into something almost boutique and with really interesting housings, you know, uh, exotic artistic housings and 
different stuff. And this year, I can't wait to get my hands on their Freak Out pedal. Ah, yeah, I saw that, and I wondered if that would be one of the ones you'd, you'd gravitate towards for sure. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, Boss used to make uh, a Feedbacker. Yeah, I remember it, the DF2, and I think. And it never sounded nor it never sounded real yeah it was you know, weird it sounded, yeah which is not necessarily a, an issue you know i mean i'm sure you can find uses for it yeah but it never sounded like real a guitar going into feedback yeah this sounds just like a guitar going into feedback yeah it sounds it, amazing just whatever note you hold it sounds it just sounds like that note is then moving into that natural yeah. overtone harmonic feedback that you would get if you're playing real loud and standing in just the right place that's great so uh, yeah, I think it's... I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, it also struck me a little bit um, in some of its behavior, like a sustainer pickup that you might put on your guitar. But you've got a they're, bit more flexibility with the, like with the latch yeah, and stuff. I mean, yeah, theoretically, it's it's endless. And they have an Evo setting where it delays the the attack up. Yeah, so it sounds you can like click the dry off. Evo. So I'm looking forward to trying out and see exactly how much, you know, of the sustainer type thing it does but even if it just does that feedback thing i i'd be happy i think it's really interesting plus they had this cabinet simulator they're calling it a cabinet simulator oh yeah virtual yeah. Cabinet. but there's obviously some sort of amp simulation in there too mm -hmm. and um that's all the guys at the booth were playing through and you would close your eyes you'd swear they were playing through an amp really wow it, it sounded it sounded very very natural and really good and that's, that's cool. a handy thing to have. Yeah, that's always a handy thing to have. And now that looks like so, a, that pedal, that cab sim. I had a look last night on their site. It's just like a small compact pedal size, and it looks like it's got yeah. two sides. Like you could run stereo two different cab models. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I, you know, I didn't get deep into it. I'm not sure exactly how it works or all the stuff. But um, I'm definitely going to try and get them to send me one, so I can uh, check it out and. Uh, you know, as as usual, Earthquaker. You know, not just because they're one of my advertisers, but they had they want to, they, they have a great booth always. I mean, yeah, they yeah. they spend a lot of money and and it's enclosed, so you can hear the stuff. And oh, that's they cool. Have great, they have great people playing. I mean, they actually have little rooms you can go into and play the stuff. But they also their booth in general has some walls on either side, and oh, between cool. that and their location, I mean, they have people demoing. So they have Nick Reinhardt every year. This this year, Nick and uh, oh, cool. Juan. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but uh, the bass player who has his, his own pedal type show, Alderel or something. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but he uh, they they performed. I have a little video of that I'll be putting up, and uh, and they had Novella played in their booth yeah, also. Yeah, I saw that. That was great. She did a, a duo sort of a thing. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, I'll be interviewing her for the magazine in in a week or so. Oh, um, she's, she's got, got a, a new record. New record, yeah. Sounds yeah. amazing. Have you heard? Have you heard the pre-release? Oh no, I have the record. Yeah, I've been, yeah. I've been, I've been listening to it. Yeah, it's it's terrific. It's she's brilliant. she's always been great. She just keeps getting better and and doing great. I mean, she moved to L.A. from Brooklyn. I, I want to talk to her about that. You know, so. Um, but she was there. She was also down at Red Panda, which is another one of oh, okay, yep. my advertisers, and they have a they have another, and so is Nick, and they have a new pedal called Tensor that probably won't be out till April as, as you know, anyone who goes to NAM knows NAM stands for not available, maybe May. <laughs> yeah, um, so the tensor is supposed to be out in April, but it looks great. Um, you know, I still, I always blank on this company, but there's, uh, there's a pedal that David Torn uses, this sort of glitchy German pedal that he uses uh, that's really hard to get and very expensive. And this, the new Red Panda pedal, is doing some of what that does in okay. terms of you know, holding and glitching, and and it'll be you'll be able to get it, and it'll be a lot cheaper, which is nice. It's great. Yeah, I love this uh, stuff. They do the um, yeah. do they do the the particle particle, stuff? yeah. What they call it, the like a crunchy kind of reverb almost, I guess. Yeah, it does. Well, it does sort of um, delay stuff and uh, granular. You know, his stuff is gets sort of down into the granular. Yeah, that's a cool type place. Things you used to only be able to get with. I mean, I used to use that stuff in recording. Mm -hmm. You used to be able to get it in plugins and Max DSP and stuff yeah. like that. But um, since Kurt came out with those pedals, you can start getting a lot of those effects live, and it's it's fascinating to hear how they uh 
how they use it. So, I mean, I could run down all the interesting stuff if you want, you know, we could go on. It, there was a lot of it, you know, um, and even I, I mean, with skipping a lot, like uh, electro harmonics, I don't know if you've seen that Blurst pedal, the new oh, analog. Yeah, yeah. That thing sounds amazing. I mm -hmm. can't wait to get my hands on one of those. Um, Did you see, um, we were talking about the freak out that with the kind of feedback you think. Did you see the plus pedal? It's like a piano sustain pedal. Yes, I didn't see it. I didn't see it there, but so, either somebody told me about it at the end and I looked it up uh -huh. and I found some video of it and it seems amazing. I mean, it's kind of cute that it looks like a piano sustain yeah, pedal, sure. but I mean, I wish they could make it do that in a more pedal front board friendly and they may eventually, who knows, but sure. it would be nice if it's a little more pedal board friendly. It's a little but big, it's a yeah. Big, done yeah it doesn't sound you know i guess what i'm understanding is that the freeze and the super ego that's not really a looping thing they're doing some sort of audio capture and synthesis or something okay. with that you know whereas this thing is a real looper but it's not it's not a looper like when you step on a delay hold pedal and it mm. goes ding 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 yeah, you know, yeah, this yeah. cuts out the the rhythm of the loop which hmm. is a nice thing i mean the rhythm thing can be cool too I mean, sure witness jocko solo on uh the joni mitchell yeah 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 on light tour yeah no, the one he managed to use it but um but yeah it was funny i'm just looking at it on my list here so i didn't get to try it there um we'll see what happens with them you know i don't know how far into production they are and i actually already emailed bill frizzell about it because i know he's a big fan of the uh the freeze and uh okay, cool. and so i thought he might be interested in it so you yeah. may be checking it it definitely sounds um, more natural than the freeze i think yeah i think be, i think it's actual audio which i which i didn't realize that but i i'm not sure the, the freeze is actually playing back the audio of your and i think it's it's built on the um on the hog the freeze function of the old electro harmonics hog, okay. which was an octave or, you know, an octave synthesizer. All right. And yeah. so I think somehow they're using your audio to synthesize the sound that then holds okay. on those. I could be wrong, but, um, but just, that's what my ears tell me. And somebody was mentioning that in relation to the plus pedal. So, um, that would be my guess. Um, now, I don't know, you know, Mad Professor pedals? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, those, I mean, they've always made great stuff, but they've always been insanely expensive. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because of the dollar versus the whatever the Swedish uh, money is, but they had two pedals there that I actually got to try. Uh, one that emulates a tweed fender and another one that does the Dumble thing. Okay. And they both sounded great. And uh, Hari was telling me the prices, and they're – perfectly reasonable mm -hmm. i mean they're cool. well within the you know lower end boutique price price range so they'll I'll, I'll be looking for those um ranger was there i don't know if you how you pronounce it ranger or ranger he's this uh interesting british guy he makes these really strange shaped pedals sometimes you know they're like they'll be triangular shaped and uh cool. but i do all sorts of interesting stuff and he's got a small version of one that he has been making and what's cool about it is it's a um it's like a chopper or a tremolo chopper okay yep but rather than having a tap tempo on it you can plug a microphone into it and put the microphone in your drummer's bass drum <laughs> cool. so that you'll always be synced you don't yeah. have to you know in other words if the drummer fluctuates a little bit you don't have to be on a track you don't have to be you know, he doesn't have to play to a track. He doesn't have to, you know, the time doesn't have to always be perfect, but yeah. you'll always be synced, which I thought that's a great idea. And now the pedals, and he had it in a larger pedal, but now he's got a small version of it, which I think will help. Um, what else have we got? Uh, oh, well, um, um, I've become the source audio rep in Nashville since last we spoke. Oh, earlier. okay. Okay, cool. So, yeah, because I've been working with those guys for years, ever since they first showed up at NAMM. And, you know, I was always intrigued by what they did. I thought they were real forward thinking. They were real smart, really nice guys. But they, you know, they had some issues in terms of, in terms of 
figuring out the guitar market and how guitar players react to stuff. I mean, for example, the hot hand originally had a cable that attached it to the pedal. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. That was the first NAMM show. And I, the first thing I said to them was, guys, this seems like a really interesting idea, but nobody's going to play. Yeah, sure. And attach their pedal. You know, what if they want to walk across the stage? You can't do that. So they quickly made that, you know, remote. And, and then they brought out, I thought, a, a whole range of really cool pedals, but they were in that modern-looking, really nicely designed, modern-looking yeah. car, stitch plastic things that, you know, I like. I was talking to Nick Reinhardt. He said, yeah, I liked it. We like that stuff. But yeah. most guitar players looked at it and said, that doesn't look like a tube driver. <laughs> exactly. you know? So um, that was the end of that, you know. So and they were so they were struggling with that for a long time. And Isn't that and a funny thing? Isn't that a funny thing, Michael, that, um, you know, guitar players can be quite forward thinking, but yeah, like you said, if the enclosure doesn't look like, you know, a, what is it, a 150 BB box with, a, you know, two knobs and a switch, they're, they're, they're a bit put off. It's, it's, it's well, odd. exactly. I say they're slightly to the right of Attila the Hun for the most part. I mean, <laughs> you know, most guitarists, you know, they're quite happy just to get the next overdrive, you know, the next two. Yeah, drive. yeah. Give me a new Klon clone. Yes. You know, which is fine. I sure. love those sounds. We all love those sounds. Absolutely, yeah. But but every now and then, somebody like Source Audio comes along with some really good ideas. I mean, their filter pedal is awesome. Uh -huh. That, um, you know, that wave shape or distortion that they were doing, Reeves Cabrels uses that. Yeah, that's but a good thing. But guys who does. Yeah. And the hot hand was, you know, finally adopted by bass players during the dubstep era. Uh-huh. But, um, but they finally figured it out, and they... Last year they had the uh, they started the one series and I don't know if you've seen those but they're um, now all their pedals come in your standard typical looking box okay you know with the typical knobs and they have one that says fuzz they have one that says overdrive they have another chorus a phaser and a tremolo and they all sound great and if you just want a box they're reasonably priced mm -hmm. you know and you just buy it and you're happy. But because they're source audio, you can plug your phone into it, and there's an app that gives you an amazing amount of tweakability with them. Cool. So you can go in and do things with them that you could never do with that kind of pedal. Plus, you can buy the fuzz pedal, and it will, it will do all – you can load all the overdrive sounds into it. Okay. Or you can buy the phaser, and you can load all the flanger sounds into it. Cool. Or you know, or chorus sounds into it. You you only have to buy one of them. But you know, if you're the kind of guy that doesn't even want to think about that, you yeah. want a phaser, buy the phaser. Sure. So that's been doing better, I think, for them. Plus, they're all MIDI. You need to use their hub. But um, once you've got the hub, you can control five of their pedals through MIDI. So I mean, I just took one look at that, and I live in Nashville, and I'm thinking a guy's going on tour. He's used a bunch of tremolo on the record. He's got four different speeds and three different depths. Yeah. What is he going to do? Take seven tremolos with him? No, you take the one tremolo, source audio, you plug the hub in, and you know you put it in your drawer, and you've got, for each tune, you've got exactly the right depth or exactly the right sound, you know, harmonic tremolo, whatever you need, it's all there. So starting from there, you know, you can extrapolate. But what's really, this year, has put them on the map is the Nemesis Delay which you may have heard about. Um, their Nemesis Delay is does everything the Strymon does, mm -hmm. except everything Timeline does except looping, and it's two-thirds the size and two-thirds the price. Okay, wow. So they've been flying off the shelves. I got a couple of stores here in Nashville that are carrying them, and they just can't keep them in stock because they sound great, and they do. You know, they're really well thought out. Once again, you can go in... It's a dual engine, so you can mix and match delays in there. I mean, guys are doing just insane stuff with you can download patches from the internet because of the app and do all kinds of stuff with that. The you know, the tap tempo switch, you can also hold it down and have a hold function, oh, or you cool. can if the if the unit's off, you can tap through four programs with it. So, you know, you don't need the app or anything. You can have four separate delay programs, you know, like a line six only. Hopefully that won't break as often as they do. Sure. Uh, and uh, so that that thing has just been 
killing. And at this show, they showed their new Ventress Reverb, which is in the same housing and the same dual engine thing. So you're going to have okay. two reverbs in one in one box. So they're making great stuff, and, and they're great guys. And so I thought, you know, I'll show it around here. What, what have I got to lose? I'll, right. you know, send me the pedals. I put together a pedal board and took it around. And Eastside Music Supply in East Nashville, they just went whole hog Fantastic. for that. And the other thing that sells a lot for them is their programmable EQ. Okay. Uh, Dave Gilmore has been using it and uh, a bunch of other people because a lot of guys, you know, they want to use an equalizer or they want to just tweak their sound for different patches. Yep. And this, you just plug it in and, you know, you've got four different settings on it. I guess <laughs> Dave Gilmore has so many different settings, he has to buy three of them. He, he's using okay. three of them because it will only do four settings. It won't do 128 programs. Sure. I seem right. to remember seeing Gilmore's rig though with a Boss G7, like several of yeah. these back in the day. So he would be loving yeah, so something he, you can program. I guess he can get rid of a couple of those. Anyway. Yeah, There's absolutely. That's three. cool. Um, I guess the other, you know, probably, I mean, there was a bunch of other stuff, but the other thing that just blew my brains out was the Supro, new Supro Comet amp. Oh, okay. Yep. You know, they, they've been doing an amp line that's, doing really well and apparently the stuff's really well made sounds great they're speaking of the snarky puppy guys they've been they've been using them on the road okay yep and uh but, but this comet is a new one it's one six l6 it's 14 watts or six watts and i just sat they had a booth where you could sit inside the booth and you know and, oh, okay. and play and actually hear it was unbelievable just the the touch sensitivity was amazing and you know, I've decided I don't ever want to play any louder than that, so I think I'm going to get one. Nice. Um, I think 14 watts is probably as loud as I ever want to play. And it should be loud enough to play on stage, and it should be loud enough to get a little bit of clean headroom, you know, um, for pedals and things like that. But I'm going to get one in for review and check it out. Nice. And see what's happening. That's cool. Uh, any other amps that you saw? Um, well, you know, I did a, I did a post on, uh, Dan Phelps, a guitar player from the Northwest for mm -hmm. Guitar More Dan, and he's been raving about these Benson amps. Okay. So they were down there in the Ronin booth. They shared a booth with Ronin and I played through it, but I didn't, um, you know, it's hard to hear where they were and mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't get a real sense of, of the amp. I could get a real sense of those Ronin guitars though. Yeah. And. They're unbelievable. They really are. Um, I didn't realize Izzy, the guy who builds them, used to work at Rudy's in New York. And I remember seeing him there. Oh, at the okay. Repair when you were there. Yeah. yeah I, not when I worked there, but later when I used to bring stuff in for repair, I remember yep. I remember seeing him in the repair shop. And he moved out to uh, the Northwest in America and started making these guitars. And they're really expensive, but they're really good. I like the Strat with the, the smaller foil pickups myself. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. and the big foil pickups, you know, the Torn uses, it was a great guitar, but that sound was not necessarily, you know, didn't speak to me. Okay. But, um, but that's, he, that's what he's been doing a lot of is with these foil pickups, which that was another sort of trend. There were a lot of foil pickups at the show in various various guitars uh yeah. there's another combination match titan guitars oh from uh Kawa, doug Kawa. Kawa, line, exactly yeah. and i played one of those with he said they were wolf tone foil pickups but i looked at a wolf tone site and i couldn't find them okay but whatever they were they sounded great nice you know, they, sounded they look great those titans that's Kawa's um still us made but he, he's trying to do it on a, at a reasonable price um right yeah they 12 to 1600 somewhere in there you know is 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 you know which you'll pay for these days for a, a, a factory made fender or certainly yeah. you'll pay more than that for gibson so absolutely uh, yeah he might have a market for that yeah any other guitars you mentioned gibson they they released a really a very low cost us made line um, you know, I live in Gibson land, so I can, you you can know, see that stuff <laughs> anytime I want. So I, yeah. I didn't go to Gibson. I went to, you know, Fender has a, a custom shop 
party the night before. Nam starts Wednesday. I went to that. And okay. You couldn't you couldn't move in there. Okay. I mean, <laughs> they you know they make lovely stuff and uh, but they're all it's all I don't know if it's auctioned off or you just you fill out a card and you put it on the guitar saying your store wants one and then they know how many people want them and that's how many they build. Okay. Okay. Um, so they you know they build a lot of that stuff, but. You know, Gibson and Fender, there'll be plenty of people reporting on Gibson and Fender, I figure. Yeah, you know, sure. I, it's my turn. Oh, well, no, for guitars, this year they had a boutique guitar booth, sort of, where a bunch of different boutique manufacturers, I guess, chipped in together and put all their stuff in one, you know, decent sized booth. Okay, yep. But when, you know, when we talk boutique guitars, people think of, oh, you know, it's a really nice telly copy or a strat mm -hmm. copy or, or you know maybe a collins or a collings or uh no these are art guitars these are guitars that don't look like anything uh, well you know teufel right i mean he's the guy who does the guitar that that adorns my guitar modern band yeah yeah that's incredible but he also does one uh what what the hell is it called um the uh his first, it was sort of, I think it was sort of his first guitar, the Birdfish, the one with the, that has metal sections sticking out. It looks like a pontoon boat. Okay. I don't know if you've ever seen those. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> really. Have to check that out. So he had one there with like leopard skin pontoons on it. I mean, not actually leopard, but leopard skin pattern pontoons. Mm -hmm. But the other people, there were, there was a guy, D. Donato from Italy who had these incredibly beautiful wood bodies, sort of like no cutaway, but you know, the neck meets the body above the 12th fret. So that's not a problem. So they yeah. just looked like, you know, no cutaway arch tops with flames and beautiful, but he, he makes them incredibly thin, solid body and he puts the electronics on the outside. Okay. Which sounds like it would be really ugly, but he, the way he does the electronics, it just looks very cool. One guitar, he actually made the knobs out of plexiglass himself with, with some sort of threads inside. I mean, these are works of art, complete mm -hmm. works of art. And I played it, and it actually played really nice and sounded decent. My only kick, and I told him with his guitars, is he places the bridge pickup a little too close to the neck pickup and the neck. Okay. So when you play them together, it sounds almost like a strat out of phase. And, right. And the bridge pickup doesn't quite get as much, you know, bite as I would like. But, but they're just as a work of art. They're phenomenal. Um, what what's that name again? D Donato. D I D O N A T O. You can look them up online. Yeah, cool. I have pictures of those. And Jersey Girl, you may or may not have heard of. They're these, this uh, Japanese guitar making group. Mm -hmm. where they make every single part of the guitar they carve out of wood and wow. and they're just all custom made and bespoke and they're sort of interesting looking uh this guy peter malinowski who was at at one of the nashville guitar shows he was showing some stuff i can't even begin to describe it it's like you know think of an apps if picasso made a guitar okay. it would like, not even picasso more like jean moreau made a guitar i mean it was and Miro, not Jean Moreau, the actress. And, uh, you know, uh, Michihiro Matsuda, I think, is known for his acoustic stuff, but he had, he had some electrics there to look more like a Picasso made a guitar, but just made out of spectacular woods. Um, and a Belgian group, uh, Belgian group called Dao Guitars, T A O, um, had some beautiful stuff. But uh, this guy Michael Spalt from from uh, Vienna had these guitars that just looked looked like they should be not played but sitting in museums. Okay. I mean, they had they had little built-in dioramas, and wow. one had a, uh, a sort of Tesla type Tesla type thing going on with you know that was supposed to react to the sound, okay. to the noise, but because the noise floor level was so high, uh -huh. it just kept going and going and going and never stopped. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll have pictures of all that stuff. And, uh, that was nice, especially, you know, for, for my site, it's nice to see some people pushing the envelope. I don't know, you know, which of those, which of, or if any of those people will actually 
warm to act, taking out and playing in uh, mm-hmm. in um, in a concert situation. But you know, um, even as works of art, I mean, yeah, beautiful Les Paul's a work of art, but these are really pushing it into another. You know, I mean, if a, if a if a Les Paul is a, uh, you know, these are practically Jackson Pollock's compared to a Les okay. Paul okay. Cezanne. Wow. I mean, it's they're really they were really pushing it, but it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was just fun to see them and take pictures of them and, and know that somebody out there is trying to rethink the instrument. It's a really hard thing to do. That's one thing I told the guy from Titan. I appreciate it. He came up with sort of a new shape and headstock look mm-hmm. that I thought really works, you know, sits somewhere between classic and pawn shop and modern. Yep. And that, that seems to be the hardest thing to do with guitars is to, push it in a different direction because a lot of people that do, they just don't look, you know, it's not even that I expect them to look classic. They just design is a, is a design is a, uh, is an art form. And some guys just, you know, they just do stuff to make it look different without thinking about making it look good. Sure. That was another trend, by the way, I noticed is, uh, the star caster type headstocks, you know, the two tiered. Oh, okay. Yep. Two tiered headstocks uh, that Iowan uh, company BILT does it, built guitars. And there was some, I think it was maybe even another company from Brazil that was manufacturing guitars with those kind of, with those kind of headstocks. I saw a lot of those. And they were Fano, I guess, was doing that for a while. He's been doing that for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Just... apparently he doesn't even own the name anymore. Oh, really? Fano, okay. no, Fano. I don't know if your listeners have been following this, but uh, there was a whole thing called Premier Builders Guild. I've heard that was of around them, yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah, well, they were my first sponsors on the website. Um, and they were a consortium that was trying to help boutique manufacturers increase their output and, you know, through pooling sources. So at, at the beginning, they had Baker guitars, they had Fano guitars. They had another guitar manufacturer whose name was slipping my, slipping my mind. And they had uh, two rock amps. They had um, another amp company. Mm-hmm. I think that was there were five of them. Well, apparently all sorts of weirdness went down with that company. Okay. okay. So, um, oh, uh, Saul Cole was part of that also. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Cole guitar. So Cole he guitars, pulled out. See. Saul's on his own. Yeah. He was there. He had some beautiful instruments. Yeah. Um, and Fano, though, I'm not sure what he's doing now, but the name is still belongs to these guys who bought it from Premier Builders Guild, and okay. they're building the guitars. So there were some of those there. And Two Rock, I think, pulled out, and they're, they're separate now. And okay. Yep. I can't remember the name of the amp company, but um, there was another amp company. But, um, yeah, what else was interesting? Uh, Sir Guitars is now doing an offset body, like a Jazzmaster style body. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. They jumped on the, uh, the offset. Yeah, wagon. they're trying to keep that price down. And uh-huh. I didn't get a chance. To, he had all this stuff locked onto the uh, – you couldn't even take them Oh, really? Down. Okay. Locked, yeah. But I got to talk to John. I hadn't seen him in a while. I hadn't seen his wife in years. And, yeah. And I got to talk to Scott Henderson for a minute in their booth. Um, cool. Awesome. I'm a big Guitar Wank fan, the podcast. The podcast, you yeah. To... Yeah, I've heard so, that. It's got a, an Australian host. I, I, I forgot yeah, his name. Yeah, yeah. Do you know that guy? I don't know the guy. I've heard the show, and the accent is very, uh, you know, familiar. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's a good show. Yeah, yeah. And who's the other guy? Yeah, it's Scott a good Henderson show. and the other jazz Bruce guy. Foreman. Yeah, Bruce well, Foreman. Bruce Foreman. He used to, I mean, I used to live in the Bay Area, and he was the sort of go to jazz jazz guy from the bay area but oh, he's it's amazing yeah moved. yeah he's really good and i love that cow cowboy band that he's put together it seems really like a cow yeah, bomb yeah 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 which is a, a great idea and i think they're just they're you know the greatest duo since abbott and costello I mean, <laughs> you know troy that's his name troy mcgovern uh oh, that's it yeah, yeah. three of them just it's the three stooges but yeah. you learn stuff i mean they're really you know they talk about when they get down to talking about yeah, music yeah yeah i i find it fascinating and absolutely they really, uh, like who who better to talk about some of that stuff than those those guys 
Yeah, they have tons of experience. They're great players, and they name names. I love that. You know, <laughs> yes. they, uh, you know, when they call people out, they they're not afraid to name names, uh, <laughs> which is fun. Always makes it more interesting. And Scott is just the nicest guy. I mean, I interviewed him for guitar player, and mm -hmm. we had a great conversation for that. And so it's just great to say hello in person. Um, and I, that's uh, I don't know. I'm looking down my list. Um, as you can see, it was oh quilter amps. That was really interesting. Okay, yeah, they they make these very lot, very small, mainly class D very kind small of stuff. Transistor, yeah, but they I played through it. Sounds great. Yeah, it really right. sounds. Now they're making one the size of a pedal that's forty five watts. Far out. You know, the great thing about those, I don't know if you remember the block. I forgot who used to make it, but it was called oh, the power block. Crate, crate made that. Crate. Yeah, I had one of those for a while. They were. Um, you know, it's it's just a great if you do fly dates or or just any guitar player. You know, tubes, as we have all found, are problematic. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I found that really a case in Nashville where the power can come out of the wall at like 128 to 130 some odd volts, and which is why I got. Uh, I should mention this. I don't know if they sell to Australia or if this is an issue down there or wherever, but. This guy makes a thing called the brown box that everybody in town is using. And okay. it's, it's, it's not a power uh, conditioner. Those are really big and really expensive. This thing is small, but it will take the power down to 110. If you're using a vintage amp, you want to be playing. Those things were designed for like 110 volts. And, okay, yep. and as a, a friend of mine here, um, informed me, you know, these days the infrastructure is so bad in most American cities that rather that they have to keep pumping the voltage to supply the infrastructure is bad and the population keeps going up. So they just keep pumping the voltage higher, which for the most part doesn't affect anybody except if you're running a vintage tube amp oh, okay. or almost any tube amp. Yep. So I've been going through tubes right and left and, you know, they're always problematic on the road. They're problematic. Um, so the great thing about the quilter, you know, I mean, some people will use it as their main amp, but these things are so small, you can stick it in a bag. And if you hit a place where all of a sudden your rectifier tube goes, your power tubes go, and you don't have replacements, yep. you just plug the speaker from your amp into them and you're ready to go. And, and they, you know, they've come a long way. They feel, the one I played through felt really good. Wow. Even in... You know, the trick for me, I mean, they can all sound decent when you're cranking them up to metal distortion levels. You know, I mean, at that point, you know, it's so compressed. How do you know how it yeah, sounds? Sure. Or yeah. it sound. But this thing sounded really good at, you know, slower, bluesier overdrive levels where you can back off your guitar and um, and clean it up and do that kind of stuff with it. So. I'm looking forward. I don't know, you know, when they're going to hit the market, but he's got a whole line of those coming out. That's great. Um, we, when we spoke last time, Michael, we we spoke about this idea of it being a golden age of of pedals, at least. But man, it just seems like across the board, all all these promises we've had for years are, are starting to work. Like modeling, modeling's been around for quite a while now, but some of the stuff coming out now is being taken very seriously, and 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 people are pros are using it and um, if you want a vintage vibe to guitar, but it, it plays in tune and, um, you know, and plays great, it feels great as well as having a cool vibe that that's plenty of people do that. If you want a great sounding tube screamer, people do that. If you want some crazy off the wall pedal is, it just seems to me across the board, that's, there's some really amazing stuff for just about any player that's yeah delivering on the hype. There, well, there is. I mean, there is, is. And you're right. It is across the board. I mean, there's, there's. I, I'm not sure what we spoke about last time, but I mean, in the last year or so, I mean, I've had a chance to check out these Whitfield. This guy Whitfield makes these tellies, mm -hmm. low, relatively locally, somewhere down south, that they feel to me as good and sound as good as I reviewed one for guitar player. They sound as good as, you know, a '50s telly. There's no reason you have to go out and spend fifty thousand dollars for a 50s telly mm -hmm. to get that vibe and that sound anymore and you can take it out on a road and not worry about it for 1500 bucks or you know maybe two grand yeah well wow. um and that's what a lot of nashville guitar players do you know they don't 
they 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 have them made. Um, you're right, amps. The other thing this guy told me about the power thing, uh, he mentioned that um, that you know people talk about vintage guitars, and he said, you know, yeah, they age well, but amps don't age well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so. you may want to have a, a old tweed champ around the house or an old tweed this or that and stuff or for recording. But when you go out on a road, you want reliability. Sure. You yep. want something that's going to give you that vibe. And, and that's around too. You're right. And the, and the pedals, the pedals, you know, you can get virtually anything you want, different flavors of anything mm-hmm. you want. And the modeling, I just uh, did an article for um, Guitar Player on the Camper. Okay. Yep. And that people are just freaking out over. I mean, guys who wouldn't touch anything but an old tweed fender okay. will play somebody's model. It's not a model. Somebody's, uh, I forgot what they call it. They're, they're sampling of the old tweed fender in a camper. Yeah, like and a we'll tone capture or something. Call it something. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, something capture. Yeah. That it's, yeah. And this guy, Michael Britt, who is in a um, famous country band, uh, the guitar player in a famous country band. He's developed a whole new, whole new um, career mm-hmm. making profiles. That's what they call them. profiles okay. yep. for Kemper. So he'll he'll take different heads and borrow different heads and make a profile and sell them. You can just download them. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there's there's those and people, as I say, people who wouldn't touch that kind of thing in years past yeah. are going whole hog for it, either in the studio or on the road or yeah. um, for that kind of stuff. And then when it comes to modeling, I don't know if we talked about bias FX. Last yeah, we time. did. We did. Yep. I mean that you know that thing is amazing. Yeah. You know, so I've used it myself. Are, yeah, I love it. Yeah, people are doing. Uh, do you have the uh, plugin, or are you using the app, or? I'm using it on an iPad through an Alasis IO dock. Yeah, and um, yeah, yeah. Very so cool. I have it on the iPad, and I just run it through in, through my audio interface into, you know, and I've done some recording with it, and it's spectacular. So yeah, that's come a long way, which is, which is why I mean, some fairly major manufacturer recently sent me their latest version of their modeling thing, and they wanted me to review it, and I had to write back to them and say, you know, this stuff has come a long way, and you haven't. Okay. <laughs> you know. This stuff just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't sound up to snuff. It's not, you know, might have passed in 19, you know, 1998 or whenever it started in 2002, but now it doesn't. Um, I, I reviewed the, uh, fire something, line six fire, Uh, something. Firehawk, I think might be. Firehawk. Yeah. And they, they sent me this, it weighed probably 85 pounds because it had a serious transformer in it. And finally they've come yeah. around to where they realize you need to have full range speakers. In. Yeah. Yep. You know, not guitar speakers, but yes. full range speakers. So they put full range speakers in it and all the stuff in it. And it sounded really good. Uh-huh. And, but a little tip for your listeners. And I found this in other modeling situations. If you run just an analog pedal of any kind in front of that, mm-hmm. It sounds so much better. It really, it really gives it a certain kind of depth and feel that, as good as these things are, they don't quite all have yet. Yep. So, but I mean, at least that for that pedal, it did. And I've done it for other stuff like the ZT. I just got the ZT, um, whether their mini lunchbox, whatever they're calling that. And I'm going to do a review of that. And the thing is amazing. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, for that size speaker. But it's digital, and it you know you play through it. If you play sort of clean, it sounds pretty decent. But you don't want to turn it up to distort. But you put up some. I put my little pedal board in front of it. Okay. Yep. It sounds amazing. It yeah, just sounds wow. amazing. Uh, I guess the Clubman Nil, Nils Klein has been playing through their Clubman, which is the bigger one, which they discontinued. But at the show, they showed um, they're going to be bringing it back in custom colors. Okay. Nice. So that's that's the one. You know, it's a full size amp, and but it's really light because it's digital. Um, so yeah, the stuff just keeps getting better and better, and as tubes get worse and worse, we'll have to see. Uh, you know, it's just getting harder and harder to get get uh, reliable tubes, and uh, you know, people are people are moving away. 
just you know i mean it's still look we love the sound we all love the sound. yeah absolutely there's certain contingencies you know when you when you're doing it for a living and you're on the road and you don't have the option of it breaking down yep so sure. i mean i just i'm just put an amp i have on consignment a uh you know boutique amp that i've had for a while and uh the first tour I went out with it on a little mini weekend tour, the rectifier tube blew on the first tune of the first song. Oh, wow. First song of the first set. That's no fun. So, yeah. And, and I had, you know, fortunately the sound man ran home and got me a little Vox modeling amp, uh-huh. you know, different models. I, I set it on one thing. It sounded great. I yeah. put my pedals in it sounded great. Um, you know, so I just, I, I mean, I love tubes, but if, if you're going out and, you know, it's one thing if you're Vince Gill and you can, you know, you got a roadie who will replace them every set or, you know, sure. on out and replace them mid set or you can take two if one goes down. I mean, Absolutely. this has been going on for, Plug into forever. The times, yeah. Yeah. You'd see, you'd see four Marshall heads up there or four bottoms. Yeah. It looks cool, but they're only playing through one of them until yes. that one goes and then they unplug it and plug it in the next one. Absolutely. So. We'll see. It's going to be interesting how this all shakes out in the next decade. Yeah, it's an exciting, it's an exciting time. Hey, so we know you, um, we know you curate the great uh, website Guitar Modern. Do you want to? You've mentioned a couple of things you got coming up, but do you want to give that a plug and, and give us an update on how that's going for you? Well, it's been, it's been going really good. Um, it was really moving along, and then I had um, we had some family stuff that started going down, um, some deaths in the family starting in September. So for a couple of months, I was out of commission, you know, in terms of running up to New York, and then and then Christmas, and then Nam. So it slowed down, but I'm gearing up to hit it again full throttle um, in this in this year, and. Uh, and there's just there's just so many players out there. It's it's now it's just a question. At the beginning, it was me having to go look for them. Now they're finding me, and uh, and um, it's just a question of weeding, weeding through it. Um, if anybody wants to send me stuff, I'm happy to check it out. Mm-hmm. What I have one way I weed through it though is uh, if someone doesn't have a live YouTube presence, you know, of them doing gigs and playing okay. live. Yeah. You know, just because I'm sure there's great players out there who don't do that or making great records in their room or, yeah. you know, they just or they play out, but they just don't have it. But these days, you know, you can have somebody out in the audience with an iPhone and get a pretty decent recording of what you're doing. Yeah, and sure. So just as a, a weeding out process, that's what I've been doing is if, you know, as soon as somebody sends me something, the first thing I do is go online and see if there's a bunch of uh, videos of them. Mm-hmm playing live because I think it, it adds to the experience on the, on the site. You know, sure, that's one yeah. great thing about, about not being paper is that I can embed these videos Absolutely, and people can yeah. just look straight at it. And, uh, and for one thing, see, Hey, is this somebody I want to read about? I mean, that's, I totally understand that attitude. You know, we all have a limited amount of time and, yep. you know, the worst thing is reading all about some guitar player that's hyped to death in a magazine. And then you go check them out and he, and you hate him, you know, okay. and, uh, and, you know, sure. what did I waste my time reading about this guy for, you know, who cares what he thinks about pedals and stuff like that. He sounds like garbage. So, um, so I, I'm all for everybody looking out, uh, at the videos. Also, I want to do a lot more product videos. I'm trying to figure out a good product video rig that I can set up at okay. home. So nice. do it as a matter of course, because that's another thing. I mean, I, at you know at the risk of putting myself out of a job uh you know it's i love reviewing stuff for a guitar player but i i told them this at the nam show why does somebody have to read a review when they can just see the stuff being played on youtube yeah and true. decide whether they like it or not you know i mean you know in fairness to the guitar player guys they are you know they're all experienced players they can you know when, when i write for them i try and tell people here's what this is really good for. Because a lot of times in videos, you'll see some guy, and I've been running into this uh, actually this week, trying to find videos to illustrate some of the NAMM stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's some stuff that does really cool stuff. Like uh, a good example, I found out about this owl pedal. Okay. That um, it's a DSP thing where you can, if you are a hacker and a coder, you can make your own effects 
and put it into the pedal and then take it, you know, you don't have to bring a laptop, you just bring the pedal and take that effect on your board. Oh, I which I is saw that. a great yeah. idea. Yeah. But then you look at the demo and the guy's playing, yeah, here's a big muff sound. I don't need to go through the hacking to get a good buzz though. <laughs> You've got one. I mean, of those. I you know, I You've want, got six I of want those, yeah. particle type sounds. Yeah, I want yeah. I want the red panda type sounds. I want something that nobody's ever put in a pedal before because you can yeah. You know, you can make it max DSP and make your guitar do something completely insane that nobody has ever put in a pedal before because probably because there's not a big enough market to sure, do it. Sure. But you can have that one off thing. So you have to wait till about three quarters of the way through the video before the guy starts playing something. Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, sure. a phaser. I don't need to I don't need to learn coding to make a phaser. <laughs> so that's that's gotcha. the thing yeah. with you know doing and I think that's that's the thing where I mean, where my site is important, you know, because the videos I'm going to do of this stuff are going to show you the more creative things you can do with it. Not, sure. you know, not necessarily the meat and potato stuff, because those guys, Pete Thorne can show you that stuff. He's Absolutely. Awesome, you know? And there's lots of guys doing that and doing a great job. Brett Kingman in really Australia does yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Brent, what, what was it? Brett? Brett Kingman. Yeah. He does a bunch of yeah, stuff Brett here. In Australia. Yeah, he's great, and there's a lot of people doing it really well. So uh, I met just Nick at uh, at the NAMM show. Okay, yeah, yeah. You've seen his videos. Yeah, uh, he's cool. And uh, I, yeah, I got to check him out more because I checked out a video where he was doing some sort of interesting out type stuff. I think he's into that stuff, so it'll be interesting to talk to him about that. Um, so yeah, I want to get into doing more videos of more products, and and I think they want to start doing videos. Um, I mean, if I can do stuff for a guitar player, that would be good. Uh, I'm also, actually, other big news is uh, I'm probably going to be doing a column for Electronic Musician. Oh, fantastic. But yeah, there are all sorts of, uh, there are all sorts of shakeups in the new bay industry. So now keyboard is being folded into Electronic Musician. Okay, okay. And, uh, and Gino Robert, who's now the editor of the Combined Magazine, he and I go back years. We played in a band together in San Francisco. So he called me about doing stuff because, um, for one thing, I'll probably be doing stuff about iPad. Okay. Yeah. Because that's something I've gotten deep into. Yeah, in you're a big year. fan. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and I've done some gigs running, you know, the laptop, the Sandoff Ableton. I mean, I've talked about that last time into the iPad and yeah. return, and and, it, and it's working out great, and it's. Uh, it's it's to me that's the future um I don't, I don't know if i mentioned knox chandler last time he's a guitar player and he's in berlin now he played with cindy lopper and okay. david Kahn, people like that but he's now he plays almost exclusively through an ipad wow doing um i forgot what he's using for actually i think i downloaded the thing he's using for his guitar stuff but he also uses these apps like iDensity and um and uh, sampler and things like that, okay. and it's just so much you can do. So, I want to delve further into that in the coming year. Delve into controlling it with a MIDI pedal, mm -hmm. so that you know, I can I'm not restricted to just my finger on the iPad. Also, because I'm playing guitar, it'd be nice to be able to of do course. things yeah. while I'm playing. So, there uh, there is another avenue of um, I mean, it's endless. You know, just another avenue of exploration. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> If you want, if you want to get into that kind of stuff, and uh, so that's you know that's sort of I'm, what I'm going to try and do is do a cross pollination thing with the electronic musician column and my site, so that maybe I'll put the video up on my site and link to it from uh, from the because the uh, EM column is going to be in print, yep, and and online, but you know maybe on the online thing I'll put a link to the video on my site. You know, try and just try and see how far I can push this because, I mean, it's still a niche thing. Sure. Anyway, look at it. There's still more guys who want to sound like Ingve and and Eric Clapton than there are guys who want to sound like Adrian Ballou. But um, but it's growing. It's definitely there's no doubt about it. I mean, it was heartening to see Nick Reinhardt playing in the in the uh, Red Panda booth with his little coterie of guys sitting on the floor in front of him, like a, you know, like a kindergarten teacher telling a story. 
Awesome. And they're enraptured. I mean, and he's got this huge following, which means, you know, there are people that are interested in this stuff. And uh, and it's not, you know, and, and I also found it's not mutually exclusive. It's been very interesting to find that a lot of guys who are into really ultra modern guitar are also into roots guitar. Okay. Yeah. You know, either come out of that or simultaneously. I mean, Elliot Sharp, you know, yeah, is a guy. Great example. He's done blues records, but he's as out as it gets when he wants to be. Yeah, and uh, and a lot of guys are are like that. So, shall see what the future holds. Absolutely, Mark Rebo, perhaps is another. Yeah, he said. Well, when I first saw him play, I don't know if we discussed this. You know, he was playing in a in a uh, R and B horn band. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and so he comes out of that definitely. Yep. That and Haitian classical music. Apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. But, yeah, he does it, and uh, not everyone. You know, some some people. Some people just sort of started with Derek Bailey or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> Copying Derek Bailey you know, leaks. <laughs> but Derek Bailey started with playing, you know, playing dances, playing, you know, standards and and uh, and jazz. So uh, you know, standard jazz, standard jazz, and standard chord changes and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah. So I'll be curious. You know, I mean, uh, I I'm always looking for new people. Right. That sounds good. And yeah, electronic musician, that sounds like a perfect mix for you. So that's, um, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it'll work out. I mean, and it also kicks, you know, if it's a column and it's a monthly thing I have to turn in, it's going to kick my butt to uh, to really explore this stuff. Because we're one, one column we're kicking around is um, doing, using, mo you know, modular synths have all of a sudden exploded. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody's buying modules. And, uh, and some people, you guys, a lot of those modules will take audio in and send audio out okay. and process the audio. Great for guitar. So, player. um, actually in a Roland booth, in a boss booth, they brought in, somebody loaned them a pedal board to, that had their, they have a new, um, loop controller. Okay. They have a couple of different size loop controllers where you can put, you know, six different pedals in or whatever mm -hmm. and, and control them through, um, foot switching. Well, one guy put this um, Roland module that they make. Uh, I, I, the name slips my, my mind, but it's a new one because they're doing these new modules where, like that thing we were talking about, you can load, you don't have to program them, but you can load different effects into this module. So you can, um, I guess you can make it a phaser or a flanger or a delay or something. Yep. And then he's got it. You know, because it's a module, it doesn't have a foot switch on it. But because he's got it in the loop, in the looper, yeah. System, you know, he's got a foot switch on. It. So he had it as part of his pedal board, which I thought was fascinating. Which is cool. So yeah. one thing I want to do is contact some modular. There were a lot of. Uh, there are already a lot of guys who are crossing over. I mean, WMD. Um, he makes modules and pedals. Um, okay. Who Who else? Where's my pedal list here? <laughs> <coughs> I think Electro Faustus uh, might do it. Um, who are some of the others? Um, there are a couple of other pedal guys who do, they'll make pedals with foot switches on them, but they also do, well, Dwarf Brown, he's another one. He makes mm -hmm. modules and pedals. So if I can get a couple of these guys to send me their modules and, um, and get, I'll get Boss to send me the looper. Um, yeah, no. Nice. That gets very confusing. We need new terminology for that because exactly, looper, exactly a looper, either yeah. an audio looper or a loop system. Like I guess loop system, yeah, where you can uh, where you can plug the modules in. Yeah, you could put together almost a whole module pedal board. That's you know, kind of cool. Yeah, a lot of yeah, those new which, um, loop switches, for of a better way, are running MIDI too, like the gig rig and uh, the new Boss ones have MIDI. So. That yeah. opens up oh, yeah, a whole a new world as well. If you know, we're seeing increasingly, you know, MIDI MIDI inputs on some of these more advanced pedals. Um, well, the Chase Bliss stuff does MIDI. Um, yeah, awesome. The new Empress Delay, yeah, I believe it was Empress does MIDI. Yeah, they have an cool. interesting input for it. It's just like a, a quarter inch input. That so I guess there's some way you can put MIDI in through a quarter inch input. Yeah, nice. Uh, and uh, and of course, the Source Audio stuff does MIDI if you use the hub. Brilliant. So, 
you know, you can you can put together the best of both worlds. And we're seeing a lot of that. I mean, in terms of trends, you know, I mean, guys, I guess if you're Keith Urban, mm -hmm. you can put together a rack drawer full of pedals yeah. and stuff like that. But there's a lot of guys doing the <clears throat> MIDI pedal board where, you know, they're, they, they want individual pedals. They don't want a multi effects, yeah. but they want the advantage of, uh, of being able to do patches, being able to hit one switch and turn three pedals on at yeah. once. Yeah, and so you need a pretty big board, but you can you can do that, and the loop takes them out of the uh, out of the signal path, and Bob's your uncle, as they say. Yeah, nice. Well, Michael, that's um that's cool. That's I reckon this has been a pretty good catch up. Thanks for um talking us through your favorite parts of Nam, and um great to hear about yeah guitar modern um going strong in 2017 and and the good stuff coming up for you. So uh. Yeah, definitely um, for our listeners, definitely check out Guitar Modern if you haven't already. It's a fantastic site and uh, Michael does a great job there and writing for Guitar Player and for Premier Guitar, which is, uh, which is great. So thank you again. At this point, there's four, I think we're going on four years of posts up there. So if you're into that kind of stuff, you could definitely kill, kill a good day going back through <laughs> all of them and watching all the videos and checking all these guys out. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, well, thank, thanks for having me. It's always good to talk to you. Take care. All right, there's our NAMM special with Michael Ross. I really like Michael. And if you want to hear more of his backstory, definitely check out our interview with him, Guitar Speak Podcast, Episode 6. You can find that at guitarspeakpodcast.libson.com or you can subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher. Now, Michael was suffering from the Nam thrax, from the pneumonia, which can happen at, at Nam, which you can catch, which you can contract and take home with you. Uh, so thanks, Michael. I appreciate your wisdom and your time and your wit. Such a good guy. Great to have you back on the show. Hey, listen, um, check out Michael's Guitar Modern website. I didn't realize it was almost four years. I've been following that pretty much after it started. Uh, I'm a big fan. Um, I didn't know it'd been running that long. It's really, really cool. Really cool site. All right, almost time for me to go. But hey, I just want to say I'm, I'm posting this interview in early February 2016. But we had an amazing January. Thank you so much to all our listeners who tuned in, our old schoolers, our diehards. Um, but also a bunch of new people uh, looked like were, were getting onto the podcast. So thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you're enjoying it. Just to let you know, we're also on Instagram and Facebook, and uh, we love to love to have a talk there and discuss the episodes or whatever. Just say hi. You can find us there. It's all good. All right, I'm going. Thanks for tuning in. My name's Matt Wakeling. You've been listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. Lots of good stuff coming up. So don't adjust your set. Okay, see you next time. Bye now.